Thank you for joining us to another great Australian Water School webinar. I'm Trevor Piller chairing today's webinar where we're going to explore the recent advancements in 2D hydraulic modelling. Well, it's been a big build up to this webinar. There's a lot of people on board, so we'll get this cranking pretty fast. You saw a map as we came in of all the people, over 50 countries represented. Thank you for joining us. I'm delighted to be here today, but you know what really makes this click is the presenters who are with us today, three water modeling professionals from Two Flow, uh, led by Bill Syme. We're so glad and honored to have you on board. Gentlemen, Bill, Chris, and Greg, all working together as a team on Two Flow. Bill's got over 30 years experience, as you can see there. Bill is a software business lead at BMT, but together they've been uh, working for a fair while on, um, a fair while is probably putting it mildly. <laughs> I'll leave you to, to explain to us. I've got one question for each of you, and that is if you could just tell us what motivates you to uh, take on this life. It seems a bit of a mad life at, at times here in modeling, but changing so much as it does. Uh, over to you first, Bill. Oh, what motivates me? Well, I guess I just love water. I always have loved water, love water sports. And unfortunately, I also like computer programming. So the, <coughs> the two ended up uh, marrying together. And um, I just um, have always been very passionate about, you know, how to simulate water as it moves down a river, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Chris? Uh, much the same as Bill, actually. A love of water. I originally <laughs> think I almost went into meteorology, but then shifted across into hydraulic modelling. Yeah. yeah, no, that's really right. Yourself, Greg? Oh, yeah, I'm probably the geek amongst all of you. <laughs> <laughs> I just love math <laughs> equations and computers, and yeah, yeah, it all just fits together nicely for me. Yep, no, that's fantastic. And you're all um, from the northern part of Australia, Queensland, uh, yep. Brisbane, capital city. Yep. I'm down in the south, southern part, putting up with still with the cool weather. A lot more to come. Um, but um, so gr great to be doing this together and you bring decades of experience. It's wonderful to be working with you again after many years. Well, I think we'll leave it right there for the intros. We want to get right into this. Thank you. Right over to you, Bill, to take us uh, on a bit of a journey. Um, so thanks, Trevor. Thanks, Joel. Um, and welcome to everyone. It's, so, it's actually very um, just fantastic to have so many people dialing into this. It's because it's, it's pretty exciting stuff that I'd like to uh, talk about. Before I get into it, though, I will just mention that our, we're re replacing the old website. So a lot of the stuff I'm talking about today isn't actually up on our current website. Um, we're transitioning to a new website. We've frozen the old one, and there will be a new one up, hopefully in October 2020. But if you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to contact info at twoflow.com. Okay, so an overview of today's presentation. I'm going to step back and actually just think about the the history of how 2D models thing solvers have evolved. I find it quite interesting, something I've thought about quite a bit. Um, but it helps us understand too why we are where we are and where we might be going. Like all things, there's still always limitations to be resolved. So I'll just this couple of years we sat ago we sat down and really focused on what were the the things that were holding us back and we've been focusing on those and that's essentially what I'm talking about today, how we've been addressing these limitations in 2D solvers. I'm not talking about just two flow, this is across the board. So the evolution of 2D hydraulic modeling, well I've stolen this slide from Roy Nathan who some of you would know. Basically it is an evolution and I guess early days of hydro robustness. The big question is are we now up to hydro sapiens? Have we, how much further can we go with our 2D modeling? So just looking back in time, I mean, the first 2D models started to emerge around in the late 1960s. This is the work of Lindertzi, 1967. He put out Fortran code to simulate 2D flows. And he had a really large 100 cell model to demonstrate his, his, his scheme actually works. 100 cells, anyone make a 100 cell model these days? I, I doubt it. That sort of pioneering work, as well as the work of Mike Abbott and System 21, which became Mike 21. The last of the, uh, what I would call the really good ADI schemes was by Stelling in 1984. And this is what one that Two Flow was based on. And that was, you know, that in Stelling's work, he had a 1000 cell model. So that was progress. But it's also worth noting that these guys were driven by modeling of coastal bays. And that, that's where 2D modeling started in the coastal tidal um, area. Then in 1990, this is where Tuflo sort of stepped in and 
well, I haven't seen anything different, but it really was the first scheme to successfully link 1D schemes with a 2D model, in this case of the Gold Coast Seaway. Um, and we're starting to see some graphics. This is a graphics um, system that I developed around Tuflow on the right. But the ability to model the whole tidal system as a combination of 1D and 2D really opened up the door. And we did so many studies um, using this system. Back then we had a 10,000 10, cell model of the Gold Coast Seaway, which by today's standards is very tiny, but we got some really good results. Then we moved in the late 1990s, we started to see 2D models starting to be used for flooding. And this is one of the very early pioneering studies. And it's pretty exciting stuff to be honest, because finally in the flood world, we could start to see how the water was moving around. You could really visualize the water in this case coming across the levee, through the bridge, expanding downstream. There's very dense vegetation here at this site. So that was, that was really exciting stuff. And we started to make models around the 50,000 cell mark, which we thought, wow, that's, that's amazing. Then we moved into the 1D, 2D concept was extended to the urban environment starting around 2003. This is a model of Bristol city in the UK, one of the very first 1D pipe 2D surface water models. And there's a, some of the flood maps that came out and we even started making animations back then. Yep, exciting time. And we're getting up to 100,000 cells, really exciting. But then we had this quantum leap in the early 2000s. And thanks to people like Greg and others, we went from CPU to GPU hardware. And that actually gave us an extra order of magnitude on the improvements in speed. And ultimately that means runtime. So we're getting up to 10 million cells. And so we can go to it, even started to consider whole of catchment modeling. So this is a catchment in the UK that would use two for GPU. And you can zoom right in and still get amazing resolution. It was just, yeah, very, very exciting stuff. So the big question is, what do the 2020s have in store for us? What do we need to improve? How do we make this 3D modeling even better? What I find interesting over that course of those, you know, it's been um, 50 plus years, is what I call mathematical elegance. So in the early days, there were, the computers had virtually no RAM, they're slower, they're way slower than your smartphone. Um, there's no parallelization. And the people doing their pioneering work really focused on, attaining as big a time step as they could so that their solution could progress very quickly. And so they really did some nice stuff in the mathematical space. And they're all implicit schemes, solving matrices, uh, lots and lots of line of code. Um, it was, they were really driven to get the most out of the hardware by using these large time steps and matrices. That sort of started to change when multi-core CPUs and then of course GPUs, which have you know, thousands of cores embedded in them came in. Um, that opened the door to finer volume explicit schemes, which don't use matrices. They're very mathematically much more simple. You may call them a bit of a brute force approach. They do require much smaller time steps because they're bound by things like the current condition. Um, but just there are so many cores that they just were so much faster. and uh, much easier to code up uh, and so forth. Also things like RAM or memory, but in the early days it was a bit of an issue, but in recent times, that's not an issue. You're still limited by the run times. So the mathematical elegance sort of decreased. We didn't have to be so fancy with our mathematics. But since that sort of big shift, we are slowly improving and fine tuning these final volume screens, which is really what I'm talking about today. Um, the other interesting factor is the accuracy. Have the schemes got more accurate over all those years? Well, in my view, it's a diverging thing. Um, in the early days, there were very few 2D schemes, but they were mathematically elegant. They tended to be implicit second order, finite difference or finite element. And they really did have, a, and they did use all the terms in the 2D equations, including um, turbulence. So they, they were focusing on the coastal modeling area, which needs to have all those terms, including things like Coriolis and so forth. So they were pretty high quality stuff they were doing back in those early days. Um, but today we have lots of 2D schemes out there, lots to choose from, from the explicit second order finer volume schemes, such as Tuflo HPC, um, that use all the terms in 2D equations, um, right through to much more simple schemes 
Um, there's some schemes that just have 1D equations or 2D mesh, some schemes don't, don't have all the 2D terms, and some are first order, which can suffer from numerical diffusion. So we have a lot of choice here, and it's really hard to sometimes understand what, you know, which are the ones to use and which ones are appropriate. Today we're, pro we're talking about the top end of town because that's what we're into, that's what we focus on. Um, but if some of these other ones are fine in certain situations, but just be very careful using those. And why should we be concerned about that? Well, it's sort of quite simple the way I see it. Th th these are all the key terms that 2D equations might um, try and solve. Um, you know, you're trying to determine how water changes its movement over time, and you, that is affected by inertia, Coriolis, gravity, bed resistance, atmospheric pressure, turbulence, um, and any external forces. So if you're modeling something like that on the right, so that water is fairly moving slowly, you see a guy riding a bike through it, it's a mixture of ponding and slow movement. You do need gravity because the water's got to move downhill, and you need the some sort of bed resistance, normally Manning's N equation, which is resisting that gravity. And that's effectively all you need to model that type of um, flooding. And that's fine. But not far away from where that person is riding the bike, we have this going on. And that's really, really complex flows. Um, and whilst you might not, might not need Coriolis, you might not need atmospheric pressure or any external forces such as wind, you certainly need gravity and bed resistance, but you definitely also need inertia and turbulence because those terms all can play a role in how this water is progressing down here. And so you do have to understand whether your hydraulic solver is suitable to your problem. Are the mathematics appropriate? And a really nice example of this, which I've shown in the past is, this is showing um, water level rising with time um, from a levee breach onto a floodplain. And uh, originally software A was used and that was the result. The person doing that modeling was a bit concerned about the results just based on how they looked and you know, their unsteadiness. Um, you see that in the results there. Um, so they ran another piece of software, software B, and they got a, quite a different result and a very different propagation times. So they did the right thing. They then explored this further because being a fairly critical study, they um, also ran it in software C and got that result. In fact, almost too similar to software B. If you have a closer look at the software, it really does, they're all presented as 2D software, but um, when you look at a closer look, you'll find out that the software A is just a simple 1D solver of a 2D grid, whereas B and C are advanced second order uh, solvers from that coastal um, era. So, you know, you will get differences when the hydraulics get complex and it's really important that you understand that. So make sure your hydraulic solver is appropriate and if in doubt, benchmark or seek advice. So what are the limitations of our sort of modern day accurate 2D solvers? Um, the things that are, have we've known about for some time um, is the issue of subcell turbulence and all. Basically the turbulence models that are used are uh, often cell size dependent or inaccurate, um, particularly when the cell size gets a lot smaller than the depth. That has become a major issue. Um, some first order schemes, if you're using one, are numerically dispersive, but are not a substitute for turbulence. They'll give a similar effect, but they are not a substitute for modeling the turbulence. So subcell turbulence has been known for a long time. Even Mike Abbott in his work in the 1970s identified that. Um, mesh resolution orientation design. Well, this is, a, this is always a, a challenge for modelers, uh, so particularly for fixed grid models such as two-flow HVC. But you know, your flexible mesh models can also suffer from this if they're not well designed. You can get sawtooth effect along the edge or dry, due to dry cells protruding into flow paths. If your mesh is too coarse, it'll block or restrict flow paths. Um, typically, schemes just have one elevation per cell or in Tufo's case, it's one elevation per cell and per cell face. So that can be a poor representation of the underlying terrain. 
And of course, 2D fixed grids, uh, historically, don't, you can't vary the 2D cell size, which is, can be a major limitation. So we'll start with uh, turbulence and then we'll move on to mesh resolution, orientation and design. So why is turbulence a problem? Well, cell sizes are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And that is a problem as we've discovered through over the last few years through some pretty rigorous benchmarking and testing outcomes, not, and not all done by us. The one that really opened our eyes was the Brisbane River model, which was a regional model, extremely well calibrated. Um, it's just very little doubt about the um, uncertainty in that model. It was developed at 30 meters. And then when that model was re released uh, to the public use, um, other consultants were making cut down models that reduced the cell sizes down to five or 10. They were looking at infrastructure works within the river, wanted faster run time. And so they make a little cut down model just to cover the area, their study area. And it's a good example of where the cell sizes started to get well underneath the depth. So the Brisbane River flows at four to six meters per second, uh, 20 to 30 meters deep. It's a big fast flowing system. As a consequence, they needed to recalibrate those cut down models. And to do that, they had to use non-industry standard manning standard values. So that immediately rings alarm bells. You have to start thinking about what's going on there. And we suspected turbulence was the cause, but we couldn't confidently say that. Other things we have been doing or have done in the past is models of fluent tests, often very, very poor reproduction using industry standard parameters. So that's, you know, we had to change the uh, turbulence coefficients or things like that. Um, and of course, the other thing we've noticed is um, poor mesh size conversions can occur, particularly once your cell size is much less than the depth. So that's essentially what is happening here in the Brisbane River. You reduce your cell size down, you get um, quite a big change in results. And that's a big issue for quadri and flexible meshes because they have a multitude of different cell sizes. So our conclusion was we really needed to find a turbulence scheme that is insensitive to cell size. So why turbulence? Well, Da Vinci and others were just fascinated by turbulence. This is a sketch by turbulence. And I think the thing that's to appreciate is that turbulence happens at an infinite scale from the very tiny molecules up to very large eddies, eddies that form. So it's got a huge scale. And there's always turbulence happening subcell. And it's important because your surface elevation is dependent on your velocity field. Your velocity field is dependent on your turbulence and turbulence affects how your momentum is diffused as water comes out of a bridge, for example. And then that affects your velocity field, which affects your surface elevation. So it's a vicious cycle. So if you don't get the turbulence right, you won't get the rest right when your flows are complex. So on the right, we have an image of some eddies forming. And basically what we're talking about is the effect or the energy loss that's happening sub 2D cell due to that water churning around like that. That's what we're trying to model. And the traditional approach to, uh, is to use large eddy simulations. And this is the approach used by those pioneering um, people back in the 60s, 70s, 80s. And the favorite approach was this Megarensky formulation. And that's fine for big large cells when, you, when they're much relative to the depth, but it is not designed when the cell size is much less than the depth. Megarensky is proportional to cell area. And as your cell area gets smaller and smaller, Megarensky tends to zero turbulence state. So what do, 2D cells are becoming smaller, cell sizes are less than the depth. Measures that vary cell size really need a cell size independent turbulence parameter. And that's what we're about. Can we come up with a 2D cell size independent turbulence model? So our approach was to test a range of models that were published. Um, they're the ones we sort of selected. The K Omega and K Epsilon were knocked off early in the game. Um, we benchmarked to Think to known results. So flume tests, as in measured data from flume tests, um, real world data where they had low uncertainty, such as the Brisbane River, where there's very, very little uncertainty about the flows and the water levels. And try and come up with an optimum parameter for each of these benchmark models for each of these different models. Can we develop a one size fits all turbulence model? 
The three models we started with was a right angle flume bend out of Kansas Uni, uh, 15 centimetres across here, very small, uh, measuring the head loss around the, the bend. This is um, the dam break test of water flowing against the building used for the UK benchmarking test six, it's about three metres wide. And the Brisbane River, so a 200, 200 metre wide river, um, but with very little uncertainty over the flows and the water levels measured along there. So what we did for each of those models was to run them at multiple resolutions. So in this case, the right angle bend, we've got two cells across there all the way to down to 6.5 millimeters, which is um, a whole bunch of cells across here. So we ran all the different cell sizes for each of those three models. And now for each of the different turbulence models, we we're trying to establish what was the optimum parameter. And so, on the chart on the right, we have the energy loss across that right angle bend. The dashed lines are what, were the, the, what was measured. It's, you know, they had a range of measurements which fall inside here. And this is the number of cells across that little flume model. So from two up to 32. The black squares is a no turbulence, zero turbulence model. So as you would expect, it gives the lowest um, energy loss around the bend. And you can see you start to get a convergence around eight to 16, you know, around this eight cell mark, it's converging. But at two cells, it's very coarse and it's too coarse to pick up the flow patterns and doesn't give a good result. Um, so we tried then increasing the constant value. This is 0 0.001, 0 0.002 and 0 0.005. The right answer is probably around 0 0.004. And what you can see, convergence is attained around eight cells across the channel. And if you're going to use a constant viscosity model, you need to have a value of about 0 0.004 to calibrate that model. So we're going to play a game now, which is, which is the odd one out? I can't get you to put your hands up on this virtual tool, but um, I guess you have a good crack at that one. So which is the odd one out? So we have constant, but this is a chart we were just looking at. Um, this is Megarinsky. Uh, 2D form of Wu, the 3D form of Wu, and Prandtl. Now, for those who are astute enough, you'll notice that the old one out is Smegarensky, and that's because there's no matter what value you specify as coefficient, you never ever get the right answer. It converges down to the no viscosity case, and that's because Smegarensky is proportional to cell area, and therefore proportional it tends to zero as the cell area tends to zero. Um, constant was about 0.004, Wu value is uh, for 2Ds in around close to 0.5 and so forth. But all the other four schemes um, successfully converge to an answer, typically starting around the eight cell mark. Brisbane River, similar story and no surprises. Smagorinsky is the odd one out. The dash line is the head drop measured across this part of the river. Um, and uh, Smagorinsky, you, just using Smegorinsky on its own, we'll never get there. And that's why Tufel actually uses by default uh, up until the latest release, Smegorinsky plus a little bit of constant because you need a bit of constant when, as the Smegorinsky tends to zero. Um, so constant, I mean, what's interesting here is you've got a value of 10, keep that number in mind. The previous one had a value of 0.004, Wu 2D values and so forth. So just to summarize that testing, um, this 90 degree bend case, dam break flume test, Brisbane River, and the optimum um, coefficients for each of those um, cases. So basically to summarize, Smegorinsky is not an option. Um, constant, impractical, because huge range in values. You have to have a different value for every cell size, and it's probably also depth dependent as well. Um, Wu2D is okay, some cell size dependency. Um, Prandtl is pretty good, but it was very computationally and memory intensive, slow down the simulations enormously. Um, Wu3D was a real sweet spot and we've done subsequent modeling as well, which has just confirmed that a really good default value is around that six or seven mark. So we've locked into Wu3D as our default for the 2020 HPC release and it's really been a really good move. So we feel we're in a much better space now of subcell turbulence, so we're giving that one a tick. We can really be confident where we're going with 
our cell sizes can now go really, really small and, and the depths can certainly exceed the cell size. Um, mesh resolution orientation design. So we, let's have a look at those issues. So the first of our new features is Quadtree. And that's really dealing with the last one, which is 2D cell, 2D fixed grid models couldn't vary their cell size. Well, Quadtree's changed all that. It allows splitting one grid cell into four. And it really allows you to fine tune your mesh resolution where you need it. The really nice thing about it, it's very, very fast to set up, literally minutes. Just feed in a road layer, GIS layer of your roads, and the rest is done for you. So you just automatically generate your mesh, something like that on the screen, and away you go. It just hooks into the pipe network system if you have one, etc. And what does that mean in terms of your simulations? Well, in terms of cell count, it really obviously has a nice effect. We go from 6 million cells down to 1 million cells in this case of this study here, um, going through three meters to a three, six, 12 arrangement. It's all about making parts of your model coarser where you don't have much terrain variation, such as your floodplain or parks and gardens and so forth, or up in the hills or areas that aren't expected to flood, just make your cells coarser. A nice effect on memory from two gigs of GPU RAM down to 0.4. So you can, that, that's a big saving if you're memory constrained. And you also get a nice speed up in runtime as well. So the last one there is twice as fast, more than twice as fast as the first one. So it really is a sweet feature to use. Um, yeah. And of course you need to cross check the results change. So this is a change in results from the first level, so no quad tree down to three levels of quad tree. And 82% of the site um, has a flood level difference of less than 0.1. And if you're comfortable with that, you can definitely move to that sort of quad tree, three, six, 12 arrangement. But it's always worth doing that comparison. Do my results change much? Um, so yeah, very comfortable with that sort of difference for that type of model. Subgrid sampling. So this is the one that surprised us all. So subgrid sampling is all about using the train information that sits with inside a 2D cell, making full use of that train information. Conventional schemes use a single elevation per cell center um, or cell triangle or a quadrilateral if you're flexible mesh. And then some schemes like TUFO also use a elevation on the cell sides. So that's so we're just sampling at those five points. With SGS on, we start to sample at a resolution that you can control. Typically, there's no point going finer than your underlying DEM or your underlying terrain. But in this case here, we're sampling all the elevations on a, a five by five grid. Um, and so you're picking up the shape of the terrain underneath. And what that means from a computational point of view is that, for example, if the water level in this cell is down here, uh, this cell would actually be dry at this point if you only had a single elevation um, model. But if you've got SGS on, this cell actually operates as a partially wet cell. So only this surface area, the blue surface area there is, is wet. And this cell face is flowing, but not fully. And this cell face is flowing. It's almost like a cross section, but not fully. These two cell faces are of course both dry. As water level rises, these cell faces are now fully flowing, um, the cells are around 85% wet, and the other two faces are partially flowing. So you get much better movement of water through your 2D system. So let's look at some of the benefits of SGS. And this is the one that I guess surprised us all. <laughs> the, um, the problem of having a deep-sided channel um, unaligned to your grid. So this is, this is the nightmare, of course, or the, uh, the pain for 2D fixed grid modelers and for flexible mesh modelers, they have to cut a really nice mesh down through there if they're going to model it in 2D. And the problem is that if you had a fixed grid model there angled to the, to the channel, to a rectangular channel, you get this disturbance developing whenever you're around these sharp edges here. So you can see the streamlines there are not smooth. And that generates a bit of energy loss because that water's been forced to take a bit of a bend. And so you get a higher water level and you stop obeying Manning's equation. 
Um, the solutions to this, of course, have been the good old 1D channel cut through the 2D, which has been done for a long time now. It's very time consuming, but it, at least you get a much more accurate representation of the conveyance down these channels. But you do lose the benefits of a full 2D solution once that water starts spreading out. Uh, flexible mesh, so you need to spend a fair bit of time with you should have quadrilaterals down here and they should be aligned with the flow and you need to have an, sufficient of them to pick up that shape. But that's a very time consuming exercise, plus you're getting very small cell sizes sometimes. Another option, of course, is just put more fixed grid cells across there, but that's very quick to set up, but your run times can become unworkable. So we thought, yeah, that's what it is. Um, it doesn't work very well. We've always known that, known that for a long time. But we thought, let's just try SGS, see what happens. And when you turn SGS on, these cells here are now all partially wet. So this cell is only a tiny bit of water flowing through it. Whereas this cell here, a fair bit of water is flowing through it. And you can see the streamlines are nice and smooth. The velocities are nice and smooth. We've gone, we're not getting this disturbance and we're not getting this head drop. So it really did um, seem to do a really nice job of handling this situation. So they started to benchmark it. Let's take a really basic case, a rectangular channel sloped according to the Manning's equation so that the depth that comes out of the model should be exactly one meter. Um, in these charts, you see the solid line is water surface, dashed line is energy, but the theoretical answer is exactly one meter depth. So if we have the grid perfectly aligned to that rectangular channel, um, the really nice thing is we perfectly obey Manning's equation. So that's, that was very comforting just to get started. We actually do obey Manning's equation. But as we rotate that grid, and this is without SGS, you'll see how the water disturbances are creating you know, a bit of noise. And you can see that in the shape and undulations along here. And we start to pump up the um, water surface because the water is finding it hard to work down there. And you're starting to deviate from the theoretical answer. And as you rotate more in this case, we're really getting to probably 15% error to the theoretical solution. 45 degrees is a bit better again because everything's sort of straightened up with the streamlines, but we're still getting a sort of uh, some effects along the edge there and it's not perfect. So we've always known this and that's why we've always said you need to have, to have lots of 2D cells across a deep sided channel so you don't get these edge effects. So let's turn SGS on, see what happens. Yeah, we know that one works, that's all good. 15 degrees, spot on. And what you should realize, these cells outside the rectangular channel, they're actually partially wet cells, they're not fully wet. And these arrows here are just an artifact of the uh, displays of the display issue. So those cells out there are partially wet. 30 degrees on the money and 45 degrees. We, this is a, we were just so excited about this because it really does open the door for using fixed grids in deep sided channels at any orientation. Let's see what happens with different resolutions. So this is without SGS, so 50 meters, pretty coarse. Water's finding it really hard to get down there, you know, choking down to one cell here. Um, and of course, a terrible comparison to the theoretical result. If you go to 25 meter resolution, it's better. 10, getting close. And at five meters, we're actually starting to get something that you might feel comfortable with for reproducing the theoretical solution. Let's turn SGS on and we're going to start with five meters. You know that works. Yep, that's perfect. Ten, 10 meters, perfect. 25 meters, still perfect. And 50 meters, it's also pretty much on the money. So it's also saying that we can pretty well model a channel like this with only one or two cells across it if you're using SGS. Absolutely fantastic news. <laughs> very, very exciting. Let's, uh, let's take a more rigorous test. So this is a U-bend test. Um, um, so measured uh, water levels on the outside and down the middle um, and on the inside. So there's a bit of super elevation on the outside, pretty well straight down the middle and a little bit of under elevation on the inside. So this is from a two flow FE flexible mesh model that we made some years ago. There's the quadrilaterals, nicely shaped. And it gives a pretty nice reproduction of those measured results and spot on with the upstream water level. 
a little bit under on the super elevation side. So we've always known fixed grid models just can't compete with that. This is the result we will get. So, you know, as the water goes around that bend, you see the distortion, you're starting to see streamlines divert and you get quite a messy result. And you're over predicting the head drop quite substantially due to all the noise that's created around the outside of the bend. So yeah, we've always known that. But let's turn SGS on. So now we have a whole bunch of partially wet cells around the edge and the velocities are now nice and smooth, streamlines are smooth, and we get a really good result. And, and this has been no, this is just using the default parameters in the new version of TwoFlow with the new turbines. This is absolutely spot on. Um, and this was actually, if you like, a real, like a, like a validation of our, a lot of our earlier work. Um, it's a bit, a little bit wobbly, not quite as smooth as a flexible mesh one, but it still is producing the right head drop um, absolutely brilliantly. So let's look at cell size effects. So this is 34 centimeters, quite chunky cell size across there. It's a bit noisy in, in results, but it still produces the head drop correctly upstream, which may be the only thing you're interested in. As you get finer, it smooths out 10 centimeters. And then for five centimeters, it's giving as good a result as the flexible mesh model. Really, really sweet outcome. So what that's telling us, if you're just interested in getting the right head drop, you can even model something like this at a very coarse um, cell size, as long as you're using SGS to pick up that, make, create those partially wet cells around the outside. Very nice. So what are some of the benefits of uh, quad tree and SGS? I'm just gonna go through a couple. Um, one is the improvement of in urban environments. So here we have a intersection model with a single domain five meter grid. We've got uh, four pits feeding into a pipe network. Um, on the right, we've got a quad tree model. So we've reduced those cells down to a much smaller cell just along the road um, gullies. And, and you know, course cell out in the parks and gardens and, around the, and then down to 2.5 and 1.25 for the roads. Let's see what happens at the, say the pit up here. So these pits each uh, have a depth discharge curve associated with them. Um, for the single domain five meter grid, the depth of that pit at the 2D depth is taken onto this chart, interpolate into that curve, and you're getting a peak flow of around that much. But with Quadtree or SGS or both, um, you're gonna get a much better definition of the depth at that, at that pit. So that picks up a bigger depth, which then in turn picks up a bigger flow and pushes a much more accurate um, level of flow into that pit. This has huge benefits for modeling in urban environments. It really does allow you to get a much better handle of that pit, um, pit flow capture. Let's look at some uh, catchment modeling. Uh, where SGS and Quadtree are having really, really big positive effects is in direct rainfall catchment modeling, as I'll show. So we're just gonna look at the River Tamar in Tasmania. Um, this is a quad tree model, uh, you know, 10 meters for urban areas, 20 meters for um, rural areas and 80 meters up in the higher ground. We have a, have a, a low a high res model, the 10, 20, 80, and a low res model, which is double that, which is simply changing one number in two flow. Let's look at what happens. So we're going to zoom into a small part of that catchment um, and look at the flows across these two major rivers. So without SGS, what we're really interested in is, are we getting convergence due to changing our cell size? And this is the hydrograph at the, this South Esk and the bottom one is the hydrograph at Macquarie. The gray line is the 80, 40, 20, 10. Um, flow and the yellow line is the 160, 80, 40, 20. So doubling the cell size and they are very different. So that's saying we have not got cell size convergence. Our cells are, are too coarse. We need to keep making them finer and finer. Same response at Macquarie. So no good. We would have to keep making those cells smaller and smaller and then you'd have a model which you wouldn't be able to run. 
Let's turn SGS on. This is a result with SGS. The orange is with the 80, 40, 20, 10, and the blue is 160, 80, 40, 20. Not identical, but very, very similar. And what that's telling you is you've got convergence. Um, you can be very confident that um, you can change that cell size even smaller and you'll get a very similar result. Uh, it's also very different to this, uh, to the no SGS case, which means that you really would have to make your cell size so small to get up to somewhere like here. So this is having huge benefits for uh, models which have cell sizes which are much coarser than your underlying terrain resolution as in the case here. Yeah, so big tick for that. Okay, to wrap up, in conclusion, just to reiterate, basically 2D hydraulic modeling, it's, um, it's been on a pretty amazing journey for the last 50 years. And as I said, it's sort of, Transition from a few 2D schemes that were mathematically elegant and, and you know, very accurate for what they were. And now today we have a wide choice. So be very careful about your choice of scheme. But the, even the nicest schemes still have, well, we identified they have deficiencies, which we've largely known about for a long time. However, as we've seen, um, cell size independent turbulence model has really solved the issue of making your cell sizes smaller and smaller and smaller, particularly when they become less than the depth. Um, the Smagorinsky is no longer applicable for that case. It's only suited to the large eddy simulation modeling. And it now means in 2.5-HVC, you can model from a flume scale to something like a large river scale without having to even think about changing your turbulence parameters. Well, if you did change them, it would be a very minor change. Very exciting. Quad tree, well, that's the easy one to understand. And it's just so sweet to be able to just drill down and put a finer resolution where you want it. Yeah, it's just so easy to do it. It's a matter of minutes to do that type of thing. Very sweet. And subgrid sampling, this is the, um, the surprise for us, I guess. Um, it really has allowed us to confidently say that fixed grid models can be rotated in your orientation. You can model deep sided channels, such as a concrete, um, urban concrete drain at any angle. And you can also model it quite a bit coarser um, than what you were previously. That's got, I can foresee, and we're doing a benchmarking of that for the Throsby Cash in Newcastle, where all the 1D channels can be replaced by the, uh, as 2D, very, very interesting space we're moving into, very exciting. And it has big benefits for direct rainfall catchment modeling. You know, mesh size convergence is absolutely brilliant. So look, the above combination, you can have all those three things together, um, or you can just pick and choose, but the above combination is an absolute game changer. And look, from my point of view, the future is looking really bright for accurate 2D modeling. So thank you. That was fantastic. Oh, the depth of experience coming across here and watching the Q&A line go at the same time, it's just a huge um, area of study uh, which you've thrown yourselves into, Bill, Chris, Greg. Um, the questions are, are coming in thick, thick and fast, so we'll get straight to them. But you know what comes to mind straight away? If you can't measure the behaviour of water, they certainly aren't going to be able to manage it. And this is, this is serious in-depth measurement going on here, as you'd all agree, I'm sure. Thanks everyone for your questions. It's been absolutely delight to watch them. And thanks Chris and for Greg, uh, both uh, hammering away at the answers there. Look, there's a couple coming through here right now. Should we, should we get onto those straight away? Thank you everyone for upvoting them to the, um, to the high, highest of the lowest prioritizing for us. So let's go with this first one. I think subgrid computations are already implemented in the HECRAS 2D, am I right? If yes, how different is the two flow approach from the HECRAS 2D? Um. I'd, I think, yeah, HECRAS 2D was, um, and all credit to them, they were the sort of pioneer in that. I, I guess what I, would, I haven't seen is any the sort of benchmarking in, in some aspects, but yeah, certainly they, they do have that feature and it's a it's credit to them. They, the, it's the one thing they've forced us to um, take up, um, but ultimately it's about benchmarking and whether your scheme is, you know, it, all schemes will behave differently, will treat this differently. So that's what I would strongly stress. Yep, no, that sounds good. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Baradwaj, that's great. Uh, Tertha asks, this model uh, using the step gradients uh, can be used for high bank cutting and high erosion mountainous areas. Yes, yes, uh, yeah, it certainly could because, uh, well, HPC uh, will, 
um, push into any supercritical flow automatically, um, and SGS will give you that definition in terms of, you know, if, if your core cell sizes are a bit coarse up there, or you can't push a quad tree cell size in, SGS will allow you to really pick up those uh, cuts. We're, we're seeing that over and over again with um, these steep catchment models. I'm hammering through these because I can see from our uh, clock, we're, we're into the, the last 10 minutes, but uh, the questions are coming through thick and fast and it's great. I can see the questions also coming, people, um, you're putting on the chat line. Um, can you, can you um, everyone, uh, go to the Q&A? So we've got a bit of a record of, of um, some of the questions and comments. But uh, thanks everybody for joining in, it's fantastic. Oh, Martin Jacobs has got a question here. In your benchmarking, did you use constant depth Mannings uh, in or depth varying Mannings in? How would the different approaches affect the outcomes? Yeah, so no, they were all um, constant depth Mannings in. Those, all that benchmarking, there was no depth varying Mannings in. Uh, look, I think there's certainly a place for depth varying Mannings in, which two flow supports. Um, but I would say that this needs to be improved guidelines. It can be a, a mechanism for calibration, but none of that work that I showed you there today used depth varying Mannings in. Yep, that's great. Look, um, what we're going to do right now, I want to in include Greg and Chris with you, Bill. Uh, I can see that um, Greg's uh, answering Martin Jacobs' uh, question at the same time. So look, uh, Chris, Greg, come on screen now and, and let's, let's uh, chip into this, this discussion going on here. It's just <laughs> fantastic. Uh, where do you want to go with this first up? Uh, who wants to go first? As you saw, Greg, you wanted to answer the one I just answered. Did you want to comment on that further? Yeah. Oh, that was the, yeah, um, I was about to, to answer that one, but then I heard you talking to us, so I thought maybe I'll talk. Um, yeah, look, I think uh, all of the calibration work and testing work was done with fixed Mannings N, but we do have, uh, we routinely run a very large suite of models testing um, our latest uh, development versions against previous versions. Um, and many of those models have, have got depth varying Mannings N values in them. Um, and certainly they all perform equally well to, uh, to previous releases. So, um, yeah, look, I um, don't have any, uh, there's no red flags to me about the, uh, the validity of their approach between fixed Manning's N or depth varying Manning's N. All right, let, let's keep going in. Um, uh, there's a lot to get through here. Well, we may not get through them all, but we'll, we'll hit them as you've um, prioritised them. Yeah. Here. Chris, you. Chris, you're wanting to answer Tim Craig? Yeah. Right. Yep. Oh, sorry, I'll go up to the top. I was <laughs> scrolling down <laughs> through the other questions. You've, yeah. you've marked yourself on that one. Yeah. Um, hi, Bill. Great talk. How would you deal with the typical 3D problems, i.e. pipe breaches? Oh, do you want me to answer that one? <laughs> yeah, you can answer. I was, I was going to type something, but then yeah. okay. distracted. Uh, yeah, question? so that's a, it's a great question, Tim. Mm -hmm. um, look, um, if basically if it's a really got strong 3D flows, you may need to resort to some sort of CFD modeling to establish the losses through that space, and then you can um, you can model that in 2D or one day by applying additional energy losses, and that's something that's quite commonly done in two flow world. Um, generally speaking, um, something like bridge losses. Uh, yeah, you, you do need that additional energy loss and that's sort of how we model it in 2D. But if it's a really complex problem, you may need some other um, higher level modeling to handle that. That's great. Okay, well look, just so we got, uh, keeping track of what's going on here, those two questions um, from Martin and Tim, Craig, uh, sorry, Greg and Chris, if you could just uh, click them off as answered or... However. I'll send that one from Tim yeah. across. Uh, th there's one here from, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce your name. Rita Hutter, uh, so memory and CPU comparison between uh, change in cell size plus SGS versus um, just the change in, in cell size. Uh, yeah, I got that, so I see Riyad Atta, memory and CPU, co mm. CPU comparison between DX and SGS. Yep. Did you want to address that, Chris? Um, yeah, look, there's, there's what, probably about is it 10 to 20% increase in memory requirement for the SGS bill, Greg, is that, is that fair yeah. to say? Yeah, no, that's fair. That's so about right. The big gain is when you move to that quad tree mesh from a single resolution model. Um, there's a video I posted on our LinkedIn and YouTube channel about a week ago where we implemented three levels of quad tree nesting and we were able to reduce the RAM requirement down by about a factor of 10 um, by introducing quad tree. It was just a much more efficient way to get the same level of accuracy result. 
Great. That's good. Should we go back to the top, uh, gentlemen? Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, back up to the... Um, um, and point? I'll just add, Trevor, that we plan to take all these questions and try and come up with an answer for all of them in a written response as well. So don't, if people don't get answered, uh, we will try and get an answer. Yep, no, that sounds good. No, that, that's great. Uh, actually, the, the top one's a really good one, Bill. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm sorry to cut in there, Trevor. No, that's all yeah. right. On the recording, the reason I'll, I'm probably making a point of reading them out is on the recording when people come back to these, which is where most of these webinars end up uh, on, a web, on a YouTube website or AWS, Australian Motor School website, and people watch them. They don't actually get to see the, if I get this right, they don't actually get to see the question. Sorry, hence the reason for Sorry about my, my yeah, case. so the top one, um, if your cell size is 10 metres, but you have a small ridge line within that 10, uh, will uh, not define with Z shape, will to flow past water through the ridge line uh, if your SDS is turned on? Yeah, look, potentially uh, it will, because if your cell faces either fall either side of that ridge line, they'll be sampling along the actual face line. The storage will be well represented because it does the whole cell, but the actual cell face is, is where the sampling happens for the conveyance. Um, so it's still really important to push through your brake lines or road crests um, and ridges or levees um, because you, they will control the flow. So you basically just feed your Z-shaped layer in of your road crest or um, levee in after you've done your subgrid sampling of your underlying terrain. That's great. Any comments on that one, Chris? Greg, one, one sentence. Uh, I, look, I'd just say that when it comes to the subgrid sam sampled models, it's probably more important than it was previously yeah. um, mm. to introduce those ridge break lines. Mm. Yeah. Mm. All right, down to Federico. Could you please elaborate on reasons for not turning SGS on every single model run? <laughs> maybe run, maybe run times, computational power, yeah, result, look, file size. Yeah, yeah there is actually... Um, there is a penalty in runtime. I think it's 10 to 30%. It's not great. It's not a big change for all the benefits you get uh, and, and other things that increase a bit as well, like memory. But the reason we didn't turn it on by default is that for, like a lot of models, if, you, if they've got a small cell size relative to the underlying terrain and they're well-designed models, you won't see a big change in results. But some of those catchment models, you'll see a very big change in results. So we, we really want people to... Uh, turned it on, particularly with legacy models. I would say that it will be the default in a future release, but at this point in time, um, we're still all learning about the benefits of SGS. And, um, you know, it's, we're circulating that feedback. And I, I would say at some point in the future, it will be, you can turn SGS on layer by layer. So some layers you can have it on, some layers you can have it off. Um, so it's also flexible in that manner as well. All right, done for that one. Alexander Karash, does BMT or Tuplo intend to release SGS verifications or commentary for dam break case studies such as Duncan Kitts has done for BMT UK in the past? Yeah, yeah, well, that's actually fine. I mean, that, that I think probably referring to the Malsapat um, dam calibration, dam break calibration that Duncan put up uh, last year, I think, or earlier this year. Um, yeah, that's all public data, so um, we can easily provide that information or point yeah. you to it. Yeah. And, and Duncan is actually part of our team, so... Oh, yes. He, he, he's, <laughs> he's, he's representing Tuflo there. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so Dun yeah. yeah, Duncan's <laughs> our UK person, so, um, yep. Yep. All right, where do you want to go? Keep going with this one. This prioritising is not too bad. Uh, Frank Fernando, how's, how SGS and Quadri... How does S uh, yeah. got to affect map out ASC.FLT? Yeah, I didn't talk about that today. That's almost another whole presentation in a sense. You have to be very careful with... Um, uh, so what we're actually developing now is a high-res output. So um, SGS has, if you've got that turned on, you've got lots of partially wet cells. The really nice thing is that your flood surface will now cut right into the high ground. So if you subtract your flood surface from your DEM, you do not have to do any buffering of that flood surface. You get a really, really nice high resolution um, depth map and other things. So look, it's, it's a tricky one. Uh, we like to output how the model sees it because as modelers, we need to understand what we're modeling. But there's some really, we've got some really nice post-processing already available in, in some of our utilities where you can turn those uh, SGS and Quadri outputs into really nice um, high res out output. But you... Um, yeah, it's a very something. good question. Yeah. Um, who is that, Frank? Frank, if you're just looking yeah. for the information on that, you'll find a really nice write-up 
on the wiki if you do a search in the ASCII to ASCII utility page. And it's at the bottom under the, the remap um, section. That'll right. show you how to get some really nice results. Yeah, and do, and do. let's, uh, out of session, after this webinar is over, let's be in contact to, um, to mm. wrap up some of these or to take them further. Uh, Matthew Christen's uh, good question. Hey team, excuse my ignorance, but for a narrow and deep meandering channel, let's say 10 meters width, ut utilizing SGS grid cell size of say 40 meters, will it provide an in inaccurate representation of average velocity in cells that straddle both overbank and in channel areas? Um, yeah, so good question, Matthew. Look, when, when the water is just confined to the 10 meters width, so those cells are all flowing about a quarter wide. Um, look, the velocity probably will be probably rough, but it'll probably be okay. But as soon as it breaks out above the channel bank, of course, the, it's like a 1D model. It, you, you'd have a depth and width average velocity for the whole uh, including that bit of floodplain that's either side of the 10 meters. So, um, yeah, you want to be very careful. Look, I think modeling at that resolution is that sort of critical channel. You'd be wanting to put a, a finer mesh, a quad tree mesh down there to get better handles on velocity. If I have a DEM with one meter grid size and two flow model with a one meter cell size, would there be significant difference in the results? Yeah. Yeah, good, good question. No, no. Yes, yeah. Yes. yeah, no, there'd be, uh, there'd be very little difference in results. Um, you get, you get some, maybe some slight differences, but if your 2D cell size is commensurate with your underlying resolution of your DEM, there's no point in using SGS basically. So. Varad Dwaj uh, Kumaresh has asked, if we are building a pure TD, 2D model, bathymetry is limited by the LiDAR water surface elevation. Right. <laughs> yeah. How do we handle this? Do we need to condition, uh, burn the bathymetry, <laughs> the DTM for a pure 2D model? Ah, uh, yes. Short answer to that one is yes. I mean, and that's, it's, I've seen so many models where people have just taken the LiDAR, they've not gone in and, and burnt through the bathymetry for either from other data or had it surveyed, and you just get nonsense results. If you don't get your topography right in your main flow channel, the rest of your model is going to be hopeless. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. Uh, if SGS is turned on, will it have the effect of presenting on the presenting flood mapping results, considering that the larger grid sides will be used to present the flooding, but the whole cell is not really yeah. flooded? Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, so this comes back to my answer a little bit before. Is, so basically, you'll, what comes out is that that whole cell is wet, but it's only computation is only partially wet. But the nice thing is, it, if you subtract that water surface from your underlying DEM, you'll get that um, high resolution um, flood mapping come out. And as Chris is saying, there's some very sh quick ways of doing that as a post processing exercise. And it's, we're going to be building into hopefully by the end of the year the option of producing that out directly from two flow as the simulation progresses. Yep, so keep, keep tuned. Uh, Carlos has asked, are there any plans to revive? Um, revive the ZSHR lines with SGS that are useful to determine times of submergence and will be great to see them come back. Oh, I guess this is the Z-shaped evacuation routes um, and feature in two flow. Um, good question. Evacuation routes have been now built into HVC. They're going to be in, Greg, can you, I'm just trying to remember on, yeah. on that one. Yeah, they'll be in the, um, I'm pretty sure they'll be available in the uh, our next update this year. The uh, the AC twenty AC release they should be available. Um, and again with SGS, uh, yeah, it all um, that's all in there and works because they're based on water elevations or um, depths over the minimum um, the minimum cell depth or face depth for the particular faces. So yeah, it, that's all been put in and it's uh, it's been tried and tested already. I thought it's all good. Yeah. And also add to that one, there's also a spatial result if you turn on the times output data type um, and you can set a, a wet tolerance as to when it'll trigger whether something's wet for the first time or not. And when we answer this in writing, um, I'll share a link with you to an example data set that we have on that. Yeah, and look, thanks very much for that, uh, uh, for that offer to, to um, continue this conversation after the webinar. Uh, Chris, that's really good, Bill. Greg, that's great. Um, look, let, let's just ask, can two flow output as a TIFF in future releases to include compatibility with QGIS? Um, 
Yeah, the, the answer to that is it's, it's on the list um, to provide all, you know, a, a wider range of um, output formats, so, but not, not at present, but it's definitely on our development list. That sounds good. Okay, the last question from Venkatesh, interesting question. How is the recent advancements helping, how will they help in agricultural water management? <laughs> Probably another, another couple of webinars there. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I think, um, yeah, I'm not quite sure of the exact answer there, but uh, um, I, I, we are exploring the possible, with the benefits of Quadri and SGS on the whole of catchment modelling, and we also have quite a range of infiltration models and some basic, we're looking at some, building in some basic groundwater functionality. Um, potentially, we can start looking at smaller flows as being accurately modelled, um, but early days yet on that. Well, look, it's been an absolutely a feast. No, no kidding. It's been absolutely brilliant. I appreciate so much you taking the time on this, Bill, Chris, Greg. You couldn't possibly put it in a book. It's too much. But a big shout out to Joel Vortman at Australian Water School and to Jess Burgess. Really appreciate And you can't possibly have these webinars without two people doing the backup uh, work that, that they're involved with. You can see here the on-demand courses coming from the Australian Water School, 1D HECRAS, 2D HECRAS and ModFlow. In the middle there, three webinars soon coming up in HECRAS, hardware selection and Python scripting. And I'll just add, Trevor, so Greg, Greg's giving the hardware selection one. So if you really want to learn about uh, hardware, Greg, right. should, that's the one to watch. 21st of October in, in the webinars, in the middle one, that, that'll be Greg's. Well done. Yep. And can I just one more plug there, um, Trevor? In about mid-November, I'm giving one that was on, that's focusing on 2D cell size selection. There's a few questions on that topic today. Is that so right? Please tune in mid-November. Uh, so, yeah, the cell then. size, probably after the 4th. Um, yep, I think it'll be the 18th or 20th, thereabouts. Yep. Fantastic. 20th November, look out for that. Once again, thanks very much, Bill. Thanks very much, Chris, Greg, uh, Jess and Joel. It's been a really pleasure to work with you all and I hope we can do it again one day. Thank you everyone for joining us, the many people from around the, around the world. Thanks so much. Keep tuned on the Australian Water School website for future webinars and training. Lovely to have you all, all together. Bye for now. Yep. Thanks, Trevor. Thank See you. you all. Bye. Thank you.